it's really funny. I mean, uh, I was up there at West Point, and I had bought a copy of the Village Voice in '64. When I was in '64, when I was 17, I rode my I rode a bicycle across the country with another guy who was also 17, and we we started out by going to the World's Fair. So we were staying in New York, and we went down to the village, and I bought a copy of the Village Voice, and and I just thought, God, what an amazing fucking paper, you know. The cover of that issue had a a, a story on the day that Joe that Cafe Chino, which was on Cornelia Street, was one of the first off off Broadway playhouses run by this guy named Joe Chino. It burned one night, and there was a story about the burning of Cafe Chino, a front page story. And in the story was this long thing about how people in the neighborhood were raising money to help Joe Chino rebuild his cafe. And then I, I read that story and I thought, holy shit, you know, look at that. And then I read the rest of the paper and, and there was polit- politics coverage. And back then there was no rock and roll coverage. It was 64, you know, but, uh, but, but it was a very interesting paper. So when I got to West Point in 65, you know, we got out of there very infrequently, but, but we got down to New York often enough because of basketball games and football games that we played like in Yankee Stadium or at the Garden and stuff like that. And so I subscribed to the Village Voice to get the, I, I realized, you know, that they had all the listings of, the clubs and cafes and theaters and all that shit, you know. So I subscribed to it basically to get that stuff so that when I went to New York, I'd know what to do, you know. And then I read it. And then uh, it was like 66 or something. And I read so I read this, some article, one of the or very first articles about Abby Hoffman. And um, Abby Hoffman said a bunch of outrageous shit. So I sat down at my desk at West Point and wrote a letter to the editor of the Village Voice that read the following. Abby Hoffman is an asshole. Signed, Gleason K. Truscott 4, West Point, New York. And they ran it, number one in the letter section. And the next week, I got attacked by R.E.A. Nyer, by Paul Goodman, by, you know, fucking half the New York intelligentsia laid into me in the letters column, you know, like I you know, just a, a fucking ton of bricks landed on me. And so I read the letters and I thought, aha, these guys are full of shit. So I wrote a letter the next week saying, Ariel Nair, are you full of shit? You know, I mean, not in those words, but taking them to task about this and that. They ran the letter. So there I was. I was like in the letters column. And I didn't write weekly, but I wrote a lot, you know. And so in 67, I was getting ready to go to the, get on a bus and go to the Navy game and on a Friday. And we, we had Friday and Saturday and Sunday off. And I was going to go down to New York and go to one of the clubs and hang out, you know, and then go down to the Navy game on a train, you know, the next day, the next morning. And, and this guy ran up to me and, and, uh, and said, uh, Lucian, you got a letter from the Village Voice, and they handed me this letter, and it was an invitation to the Voice Christmas party that night. They had sent it like a couple of days before, and so I took the letter, and I and they made us wear our uniforms to go down to go to the Navy game. You couldn't take civilian clothes, so I had my uniform on, and I got on the bus, went down to New York, went down to West Tenth Street, went over to Ed Fancher's apartment. Hung up my fucking overcoat, put, hung up my hat, and knocked on the door, and nobody answered. But I could hear this wild party going on inside, you know. So I opened the door and I hit Mayor Lindsay on the elbow, and he threw a drink in Dylan's chest. <laughs> he spilled his drink on Bob Dylan, and there, and there I was. I walked in there. And the next thing I knew, somebody grabbed me and said, oh, you're that crazy fucker from West Point who's writing those letters. Well, blah, 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 blah. You know, all these people were arguing with me. And, and you know, I met Howard Smith, and who, uh, who actually liked what I was doing in the letters column. And, and, and so I wanted to meet Wolf and Fancher, you know, because 
their names were on the invitation. So um, it took me about an hour to fight my way through this fucking big crowd of people into the back room in Ed's apartment. And uh, and I walked up. I, somebody pointed them out to me. I had no idea what they looked like. And I looked over, and standing along this bookshelf was was Wolf, Fancher, and Mailer, because Mailer was one of the founders of The Voice, you know. So they were, they were standing there kind of greeting people and talking, and you know. So I went over there and kind of waited in line to talk to them, and then, you know, and, and walked up, and I just introduced myself to one of them. And I said, hi, I'm Lucian Truscott. You know, thank you for inviting me to the, to the party. And, and it was Dan Wolf, and he said, "Oh, I'm Dan Wolf. I'm the editor of The Voice, and it's very nice to meet you. I've really enjoyed your letters." And he said, "Let me introduce." And he said, "And by the way, he said, um, you know, I served in the Pacific as a rifleman in an infantry company." <laughs> so I went, "Really? Is that right?" You know. So he introduces me to Ed Fancher, standing next to him, and Fancher says, "Oh, I'm really glad, you know, to meet you. I'm glad you could come." And he says, "And and." And he says, for, as for me, he says, I served in the 10th Mountain Division under your grandfather in Italy in World War II. And I said, holy shit. I said, so that's why you guys are running my letters. And Wolf said, no, no, no. No, that's not it at all. We're running your letters because it lights up the fucking letters column. And then Fancher told me the letters column was the most read page in the village voice. They had done reader surveys and it was very important to have like a hot letters column you know and I was like helping heat it up so then so I said to Fancer I said well Jesus Christ I said I don't care why you run on my letter but I said you know I said I've been Lucian Trescott the fourth for 20 fucking years now you know and I've been trying to get away from that legacy and that general and I thought here I am, I'm going to the Village Voice Party on West 10th Street, you know, I'm as far as I could possibly fucking get away from my family and my legacy and all this shit, and you're wearing the 10th fucking Mountain Division. I said, I'd give up. And they they all laughed, and Fancy introduced me to Mailer, and Mailer said, I was in the infantry too, you know. They were all three World War II veterans, all three of them. And uh, so that, you know, so I continued to write letters to the editor. And then in 68, um, I was, let's see, it was, it was 67, I was 20. And uh, in 68, uh, um, I had, my parents lived in Hawaii, and I couldn't afford to fly back to back to Hawaii. For Christmas, and I had a girlfriend that lived over on East Second Street. So I called her up, and she said, "Yeah, come on down for you know, stay with me." And so I thought, Jesus, that's good, you know. So I went and and stayed with her, and um, and and I was uh, on on Christmas Day or the day after Christmas or something like that. There was an event that was in an ad in the Voice for a, a, a be-in, a happening at the at the electric circus. And it was wavy gravy in a hog farm. So I decided I didn't have anything to do. So I wandered over there and paid $2 at the door and went in and watched this kind of, what I really came to call hippie fascism. You know, it was this kind of, you know, you, you better have fun or else attitude, you know. You know, smoke this dope or you're, I said, you know, they had this attitude of like, you got to be one of us or else, you know, I mean, there was a kind of like hippie fascist, ad, you know, anyway, I wrote, so I wrote this. Yeah. And so I, you know, so I, I went back to this place, you know, to this place where I stand with the girl and she had a typewriter. So I sat down and wrote a letter to the editor of the voice and it, and it, you know, and I was describing the whole scene. And the letter got longer and longer, and then I thought, well, what the fuck, you know? So um, I was in New York. I didn't have to mail the fucking thing. So I walked over. I put it in an envelope and put letters to the editor on it and walked over to The Voice on a Sunday. 
and nobody was there, so I shoved it under the door. And then Wednesday, the paper came out, and they ran it on the front page. And uh, and they sent – I never got a phone call. They hardly touched it editorially. They ran the thing exactly where I wrote it. And, uh, and somehow they got a picture of the outside of the electric circus or the Wavy Gravy's bus or something like that, ran that. And, um, and then I got a, uh, a letter from them. Uh, and in the letter was a check for $80. And, and I have to tell you, I didn't even know you got paid to write. I thought everybody was just having fun writing, you know. Because I nobody paid me for any letters, you know, and all of a sudden there I was. I I was writing in the village voice, and uh, you know, so and it and it when it came out, nobody at West Point read the village voice but me. I mean, none of the officers did, so nobody even noticed what I was doing, and um, and so I sort of skated along there for a while, um, and then I wrote more stories. You know, that year I wrote some rock and roll reviews and shit like that, you know. And then um, and then when the summer of 69 came, I graduated. And I had, I knew this guy that lived down on Broom Street. Or, I mean, uh, 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 an artist that just died recently, Jackie Whit. He just died recently. He had a huge obit in the New York Times. He was a, a real good guy. And he went to, he and his wife went to, uh, went to uh, Woodstock in the summers, and so uh, I called him up and and he rented me to his loft for a couple months, and I I had two months off before I actually started my job in the army, so I rented his loft and went down and you know moved my shit in there, and um, and went over to the Voice, and by that time I knew people there, you know I knew Wolf and Fancher and. Diane Fisher and this one and that one. And so uh, uh, I wrote a couple of stories, two or three stories that summer. I wrote one on uh, on uh, uh, Billy Graham Crusade at the Garden. And then I stumbled into the normal thing. I was going to the Lion's Head one night and just walked right into that riot because it was right next to the Lion's Head. And then that was on a Friday night. And then I, I covered it Saturday night and covered it Sunday night. And then Sunday night, went back to my loft and wrote the article and handed it in Monday morning. And, uh, um, you know, and then, then I got in the Army and I wrote some stuff from the Army about being in the Army. And, you know, by that time I was earning, I was earning almost as much writing for the Village Voice as I was as a lieutenant in the Army. I mean, even at 80 bucks an article, you know, they only paid us $220 a month in the Army. So you didn't have to write very much to, to you know, hit that. And, uh, you know, that's how I started writing for The Voice.